of tree sitter before, but you may not understand how it works. And the whole process seems somewhat mystical and confusing and interlaced with a lot of different tooling that might exist inside your editor. But today I hope that I can demystify that for you and show a few pertinent examples that really give a basis for understanding the power of what tree sitter brings to the table. But before we go any further, we need to stop. And if you're thinking, wow, I'm finally going to understand more stuff about LSP. You're in the wrong video. I did that video already. In fact, TreeSitter and LSP are unrelated. LSP is focused on understanding your code at a semantic level. And what I mean by that is it doesn't just look at the current file that you're editing or even the current directory, but it's trying to understand your whole project. It's trying to understand the packages that you've installed and everything else along those lines and provide definitions and references and completions that are accurate. That's not the purpose of TreeSitter. TreeSitter is focused on one file at a time and getting quick, and incremental feedback back from that file. And so along that line as well, TreeSitter is not a compiler. It doesn't know about the types. It doesn't know about the package. It, it knows nothing about the rest of those aspects of your project. It only knows about the text. And beyond that as well, sometimes people sort of get this in their mind that TreeSitter is like doing or running other things. No, it's not an interpreter. It's just a library for interacting with this text. So what is TreeSitter then? The first aspect of TreeSitter is that it's a parser generator tool, which means you have the ability to write a grammar and that grammar will be able to be transformed into a parser. That parser is then loaded up by whatever application is embedding TreeSitter and then used inside of that application. Beyond that, the parsers though automatically get this incremental and error recovering part of the grammar. You don't have to write that extra as part of the grammar making process. Instead, you get that for free, which is generally quite difficult to do when you're writing a parsing library for a particular language. And then lastly, and probably the most powerful part of the whole thing is the query engine. And in short, what the query engine does is part of this idea of what TreeSitter is as this framework of generating a syntax tree or sometimes called an AST or CST, and then allowing you to use queries to ask questions about that tree. That's sort of the high level thing that you need to keep in your mind as you're understanding TreeSitter. It just cares about text, right? And it helps us get a tree from that text and then ask questions about that text. So why TreeSitter in an editor? Well, you might actually already be using TreeSitter. You don't know. It's inside NeoVim or Helix or Zed or Emacs and, and some other editors as well. And so why are all of these editors adopting TreeSitter as sort of this underlying library to power a bunch of different aspects? Well, there's three main things. The first one is the incremental aspect that I mentioned before. Generally, when you're editing text, you're not completely deleting the file and rewriting it on every keystroke. Usually you're adding just one or two more characters to the file at a time. And what you'd like to do is you'd like the thing that understands the structure of the text to not have to recompute the entire tree every time you type. So that's the incremental aspect of TreeSitter. The second aspect that's really important is related to error recovery. The error recovery isn't just about your code being broken because you wrote it. I mean, that's somewhat of a given. The error recovery we're talking about here is that as you're writing a particular line of code, it's broken all the way until you type the last semicolon or close the parenthesis or close the end of your list, right? It's broken all the way until you're done editing. Well, what would kind of suck is as you're typing and editing, TreeSitter just says, oh, there's an error in the file. I can't parse it. I'm not going to do anything. That would be really bad. Instead, what TreeSitter does is it tries its best to find the minimal amount of error and then enclose that there and the rest of your file still stays well highlighted and working well. And then the third and final part that's very important is queries. And queries, that's the part where we're able to ask questions to the tree and retrieve that information out, which allows your editor or other application to do useful work with the knowledge that's in your syntax tree. So how does this happen, right? We got to start at the beginning. We have to write our grammar. 
So we write a grammar in JavaScript. And I put quotes here not because, you know, JavaScript isn't a language, although, you know, an alternative timeline where that was the case would be kind of interesting. No, because what this actually is, is it's really a JavaScript-like DSL. It takes the JavaScript and then generates a parser.c file based on that JavaScript file. And that happens through the tree sitter cli. So you run a command and you take your grammar.js and out comes a parser.c. In fact, the structure looks something like this where there's a couple JSON files with metadata, a parser.c, sometimes a scanner.c if you had to write custom C code, and then the parser.h file to include. So you're probably wondering, why C? Isn't that like outdated and illegal now? Well, yes, but sometimes projects still can use it for a good reason. What's really nice about this is the only dependency you have for these files is a C compiler, which is really good. Most places where you're building and using an editor have a C compiler available. Beyond that as well, there's a really good FFI, for those who don't know, foreign function interface story with C for lots of different languages. And what this means is that it's very easy to embed TreeSitter inside of another language and directly access those bindings efficiently. So you don't have to serialize everything and send it over some multiple different processes. You can actually include it wholesale inside of your application. This makes it really fast and really powerful as well as being very, very portable, right? Like I said, if you have an editor being built, you probably have a C compiler somewhere. This makes it really easy to use TreeSitter wherever you're building your project. But okay, so that's what we have. So once you've done the TreeSitter client, you've generated this parser.c, you can tell whatever C compiler you like using, hey, can you please compile this for me? And, and then sure enough, it'll work just fine and you get out this parser.so or whatever file you called it. And now with this shared library, we can load this into the TreeSitter runtime, if you will, as part of the application that is using TreeSitter. So if you're not super familiar with shared libraries or you don't know that, that's okay, right? But basically what I'm saying is you can kind of take this later and load it almost like a plugin. Okay, right? You can take another grammar of another language, you can load it up, you can link it, and you can use that at runtime. Very, very powerful to be able to easily add or remove or update languages without recompiling your whole editor or getting an editor update or anything like that. So before we do a little bit of exploring, I do have to warn you, I know some of you are like allergic to Lisp code and I would say, uh, you're probably just wrong. Scheme's pretty cool. I, I know all the Lisp fans are going to comment right now and agree with me, but just as a warning, that's what's coming up. So let's take a quick look at a small example Go file. What we have here on the left of the screen is a small Go file that just has a few expressions and some other stuff going on. And what we have on the right is our tree. This tree is generated by TreeSitter. Okay, and you can see that if we were to click around inside here, when I click to a function declaration, the entire function declaration is highlighted. If I click on the identifier, just the identifier of that function is highlighted. If I click on the parameter list, that's highlighted, although there's no parameters in there right now. And then I have the block inside as well. And TreeSitter is what is giving us this tree. Okay, and NeoVim knows what the tree looks like and can interact with it and then print this out for us for easy viewing and some sort of debugging. But this is where the power starts to be shown. What we have here now is the query editor, and this will be something that I think you'll be able to pick up as we go, even if you're not super familiar with Lisp. So what we have here is, let's say I select something like an integer literal, and I want to say that this looks like an integer. You see that the only two things that are highlighted in the whole file are the integers. We could do the same thing for something like an interpreted string literal. We can call that a string, and you'll see just the two strings are highlighted. But that part is impressive, but not incredible. Where it starts becoming really powerful is our ability to ask more complicated queries to the tree. So for example, let's say we were looking for all the binary expressions like this. So you'll see we have two binary expressions, which in this case just means binary two, right? Expression. So that's like a left thing and a right thing, and we're adding them together. 
But we can actually ask something more interesting than this. We can ask something like, what about what is on the left side of this here? And let's say we just say, I want this to be called a node. Well, now we see we've only selected the left side of the binary expression. But we can even filter this down more. We can use the same sort of idea that we had here before of selecting strings. And we can say, okay, well, I want to find all of the strings that are on the left side of a binary expression. And we can do that just like this. Now, this would be anywhere from very difficult to impossible with regex, right? I know I have some HTML parsing regex enjoyers in the audience, but, but, this is very, very simple and easy to do now that we're able to interact with the code as a tree. Okay, so that's the basics of queries, but what do we actually do with the queries? What, what is NeoVim going to do with the responses and the captures that we've been getting? Let's take a quick look. If we go to Go Highlights here, you can see that if I am going to select this file here, this is basically the file that powers the highlighting for Go inside of NeoVim. And if what I do is I say, I actually want to say that int literals should be highlighted instead like a function. When I save this file and re-edit, you'll notice the changing for the integers changed from integer to function. But if we do something instead, like we say we want it to be a built-in function and we open this again, my built-in functions are highlighted purple and bold. So the important bit to understand here is that this part of the query, this aspect of the query, the capture group and the name, NeoVim is sort of providing meaning to these captures. So we have different grammars, which turn into different parsers. We have to write multiple different queries, but as long as those queries return the same captures, we can use those to power things like highlighting. So, what is it used for in an editor? I just gave you an example of how you could do highlighting. It doesn't just do the highlighting, it can also manage things like finding where to embed other languages inside, right? If you're writing HTML and you enter a script tag, it should embed JavaScript. It also can do things like indenting. You can do structural editing. If you're not familiar with that, that's things like being able to say DAF in NeoVim and go delete around function. You could select a particular scope or you could tell your editor to switch to parameters. All of those can then, instead of being powered by regex or best guess, you can actually edit the tree or select from the tree directly, which is really powerful and powered just by those queries, right? You would have a separate query to tell you which things are text objects. You would have a separate query to tell you about selections. You could do all of those different things. They're all powered by the same mechanism of writing queries with a particular set of captures. You could do things like tell you if you're inside of a class or inside of a function. You can fold based on where functions start. A lot of these things before were all powered just by regexes or best guess efforts or naming conventions. Whereas now when you use tree sitter, you can actually ask those questions of the tree itself, which is really powerful. Beyond that, you can use TreeSitter outside of editors because of the wide adoption that TreeSitter has been getting. There are grammars for many, many, many different languages, which lets you write tooling around code analysis or linting or highlighting because the grammars already exist, which means you already have parsers for all the languages. So you can just make up your own set of queries and captures and do something like, I want to find where all of the imports are in a particular file. Okay, well, you use the imports, you write a query for that, and then you build this framework. The same way that NeoVim is a framework around tree sitter and highlighting, you could do the same thing for your own types of problems. This is really great for writing stuff that you want to expand to a bunch of languages, but you don't wanna write a custom parser or custom runtime or a custom whatever in each of those languages. And so that's really what TreeSitter is about. And I want to remind you, the primary thing TreeSitter is dealing with is the code in your particular file. That's all the information that it has. And it will give you a tree and let you ask questions of those trees. But because we're software developers, we can build things on top of that, like highlighting or navigation or folding or whatever the particular application that you're looking to do. But TreeSitter is focused explicitly on that parser 
incremental compilation, error recovery, and queries. Thanks everybody. I hope you really liked the video. Feel free to leave a like or subscribe or uh, come hang out on Twitch with us. Bye everyone.